This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay. Well, thank you for the very nice introduction, and thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to come talk and participate in this very exciting school. I gather it's been very popular. Uh, it's an exciting subject, and I hope to share some of that with all of you. Uh, but first, a message from my sponsor. Uh, a great place besides here to think about this set of subjects is UCSB, and look at where you can do it. So. Uh, if there are any talented and motivated postdoc or grad school candidates out there, think about us. Okay, on to the, the uh, program for the day. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a profound problem in current theoretical physics, uh, arising from the fact that, first of all, black holes appear to exist. We have growing evidence for their existence, ranging from uh, evidence for the existence of a six billion solar mass black hole in a neighboring galaxy, M87, which shoots out, for example, a jet that's about uh, 6,000 light years long, uh, to evidence uh, from our own galaxy, from orbits of stars about a central object with four million times the mass of the sun, also strong indications that is a black hole, and of course, the very beautiful recent LIGO observations of gravity waves, gravitational waves, uh, arising from mergers of black holes. So there's increasingly strong evidence, but yet there's no known description of the evolution of black holes that is consistent with the basic laws of quantum mechanics. So that's the basic problem in current theory. And I think actually this is an opportunity. It plausibly provides uh, guidance uh, for the problem of quantum gravity, the more general problem, uh, where many of us perceive a need for a conceptual revolution. We've got this basic clash between quantum mechanics and space-time, uh, and it's been very hard to reconcile their properties. Part of this clash has been uh, historically focused on uh, the problem of infinities or non-renormalizability in quantum gravity. Uh, and in fact, that was a large motivator of uh, string theory. Uh, however, this problem is really a short distance problem, the problem of infinities. And in some sense, we've realized that maybe that's not the central problem of quantum gravity. Uh, and in fact, the central problem of quantum gravity may well be that of associated with black holes and related effects. Uh, this is a more profound problem because we find a glaring conflict with quantum mechanics, specifically the property of unitarity, and uh, this really is a problem not just in the very short distance structure of space-time, it's a problem at long distances, as long as the largest black holes. So let me start by uh, summarizing the essential problem, and here, uh, well, a number of you have been at the school, but for those who have not been at the school, this is sort of an introductory slide or set of slides, so pay careful attention. Uh, this will set the stage. So here is a, a space-time picture of a black hole forming. Uh, time goes up, uh, radius goes that way or that way. Uh, say we have some collapsing matter from a star. Uh, once it reaches a radius, the Schwarzschild radius, uh, given in terms of the mass of the star by this formula, then basically light can no longer escape from the surface of the star. And so we can draw the trajectories of the uh, light rays uh, out here. They would be essentially at 45 degree angle, angles, but uh, once you reach this event horizon, uh, then the outward going light ray, so to speak, is really frozen at this fixed Schwarzschild radius and the inward going light ray is just going deeper into the black hole. So we don't know really what happens at the center. Uh, there, quantum gravity really should kick in, but as I'm going to explain, we have uh, issues with quantum gravity even further out. So that's a basic picture of a black hole, and we'd like to study the evolution of black holes in time. <clears throat> and so we can introduce a time slicing that looks something like this. There's some arbitrariness in this. And, uh, so follow the evolution of states along those slices. And for example, if we think about the vacuum of quantum field theory, there will be some zero point fluctuations, roughly speaking, of the quantum field that are always present. 
uh, or of the quantum fields. <clears throat> and one of the things that happens is this extremely strong gravitational field of the black hole once it forms a horizon uh, basically uh, pulls excitations uh, of the, well, the zero point excitations of the fields apart, tears them apart. And so we have evolution <coughs> where we have uh, part of the excitations going out to infinity uh, where they become real outgoing quanta, the Hawking radiation with a characteristic energy given by the so-called Hawking temperature which up to constants of order one is one over the radius of the uh, black hole. Uh, and then there are partnered excitations that go deeper into the black hole uh, near r equals zero. So that's the basic picture of Hawking radiation. Uh, and so in the process of, uh, well, the mathematical description of that, let me put it this way, uh, gives you an entangled state uh, where you might have uh, you know, some probability that at a given time this doesn't happen, so you have you know, no outgoing Hawking quantum, uh, and a probability, uh, which I've set to unity just for simplicity, uh, that this does happen and you have, say, one outgoing Hawking quantum. This is sort of a toy model for the state, uh, but the point is that the, the state has this general kind of form, which is very much like a Bell state or an EPR uh, pair state, uh, and has the important property of entanglement between the excitation of the outgoing Hawking radiation and the excitation uh, inside the black hole. Okay, so that's Hawking radiation in a nutshell. Uh, and so this process takes place all the time. Roughly speaking, one Hawking quantum is emitted per time r. I'm again using theorist units where I set h bar and c equal to one, and often I'll set g also, g newton equal to one, although sometimes it'll be explicit. Uh, so we have one Hawking quantum emitted per uh, basically light crossing time of the black hole. And so uh, we build up a state after a lot of these quanta have been emitted uh, that looks something like uh, this basic Bell state, uh, but a, a tensor uh, product of a lot of those. Uh, so I've represented that in, in that form. Uh, and the simplest possibility is that the black hole, you know, once it loses its mass through this process, eventually it just disappears and we're just left with the outgoing Hawking quanta, so in this state. So if the black hole disappears and that's the final state, well, notice that we no longer have in the world, in, in you know, the theory, uh, these internal excitations. So the original proposal was, well, that means we should trace out over these excitations. And so that means the quantum state ultimately is described by uh, not a pure state, but a density matrix gotten by uh, you know, tracing over those degrees of freedom. Uh, and so that density matrix takes schematically this form. Uh, but if that is the case, that means that what started out as a pure state initially, when say the black hole was formed, uh, ends up being a highly mixed state, a, um, a quantum state described by a mixed uh, density matrix. And this kind of evolution uh, violates the basic principles of quantum mechanics, specifically the principle of unitarity, unitarity of evolution. We can quantify how bad the violation is by uh, giving a measure of the missing information. That's known as the von Neumann entropy. Uh, it's gotten in formulas by taking trace of rho log rho. Uh, and as these Hawking quanta are emitted, uh, this von Neumann entropy, or basically entanglement entropy, uh, goes up and up and up and up. And uh, when the black hole finally decays, if it started out with mass M0, uh, the von Neumann entropy has a size that's basically of order M0 squared in Planck units. Uh, so that quantifies the breakdown in quantum mechanics in unitary evolution. Uh, it's associated with the fact we have this missing information uh, of order uh, M0 in Planck units squared, or put differently, the area of the initial uh, black hole horizon uh, divided by four times G Newton. And this really is the essence of the crisis. Uh, we have this you know, apparent breakdown of quantum, mecha quantum mechanics and we have to figure out what to do about that. 
Uh, there are various possible resolutions. Uh, the first resolution you might consider is a more mundane resolution where uh, you might say, well, what if the black hole evaporates down to something really small, but then there's a leftover remnant containing all the information, containing those internal degrees of freedom? Well, it turns out that that picture is apparently ruled out basically because these remnants would have an infinite degeneracy and those would make uh, ordinary physics unstable to basically infinite pair production. I don't have time to go through that argument, but it's been well discussed and so that really seems not to be the way out. A second possibility is that we've just somehow made some error in our reasoning and you know, we made a mistake. Really the information does come out, somehow there's something wrong with Hawking's original calculation. But you know, there have been 40 years of some very smart people looking at this problem, although I'm going to comment a little bit more on this later, uh, and we haven't found that error. And we've studied this from all kinds of different angles and the problem is still there. So that leaves a third possible resolution that really this represents uh, or arises from an error in our basic principles. Uh, and that really is looking increasingly likely. I think many people in the field believe that at some, in some way or another. And so that means that we really need to understand the new physical principles associated with gravity uh, that go beyond our present principles. So this is really exciting. This means black holes are you know, key guides to a more basic physics. And so that's my own view. Apparently this unitarity crisis reveals a contradiction between the foundational principles underlying basically present day physics, local quantum field theory. Those are the principles of relativity, the principles of quantum mechanics, and the principle of locality. So that's why this problem is so interesting and compelling in fact. Uh, one of these principles or more must be modified and the black hole problem appears to be playing a role somewhat analogous to the problem, or to the role played by the hydrogen atom in classical physics. The problem with the hydrogen atom in classical physics, namely its collapse, was a guide to formulating the principles of quantum mechanics. And uh, quite plausibly, in my view, black holes are likewise uh, important in guiding us towards a fundamentally new way of looking at physics. Uh, of quantum gravity. Okay, well, so let's go with this uh, idea that we're looking for some way to modify our basic principles. The first suggestion along those lines was in fact made by Hawking not long after his discovery of Hawking radiation. Uh, and he suggested, well, you know, maybe it's just true that quantum mechanics breaks down. We have a breakdown of unitary quantum evolution, <coughs> which is you know, one of the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics. So that sort of idea stuck around for a while, but it was then realized if you try to parameterize the kind of breakdown of quantum mechanics that is required, and this was done by Banks, Peskin, and Susskind uh, somewhat later, then in fact you find that uh, that kind of breakdown of quantum mechanics also implies a massive breakdown of energy conservation uh, and that's in violent disagreement with experience. If we had a massive violation of energy conservation you know, all the time in this room, uh, then you know, this room would feel, for example, very hot because you, know, you could have energy fluctuating into and out of existence and uh, you know, that's something like a thermal bath. So in fact, Hawking's original proposal looks like it's just not viable and for that reason I'm going to stick with quantum mechanics for the rest of this talk and I think many in the field are also feeling that you know, we really need to do that. So what is needed in order to save quantum mechanics? So again we've got this picture of the basic problem, emission of the Hawking particles and the growth of the uh, missing information or von Neumann entropy and the unitarity violation characterized basically by this big gap and if we're going to save quantum mechanics, what we need is a different curve than this one where maybe initially we have some missing information, but ultimately by the time the black hole is evaporated, the missing information goes back to zero. That's what unitary evolution demands. Uh, that is an order one effect. Uh, this curve is basically going up uh, you know, by one unit in each time r, as we already described. Uh, 
And what you need is for that curve that's going up to turn into a curve that's com coming down. And that you know, really is an order one effect as was originally pointed out by Page back in 1993. Another version of that argument was given by Mathur this morning, uh, his so-called uh, small corrections theorem. Uh, and so we need, in some sense, a dramatic change to this growth of missing information. Uh, and you know, how can that happen? Well, one possibility is that there's just something wrong with the picture of, or something becomes wrong with a picture of black holes as you know, simple semi-classical objects. There's some dramatic modification to black hole structure uh, and so a basic scenario for this, in fact, was considered back in the early 90s where you start out with a black hole, but at some point it evolves into uh, something else, which back then I just called a massive remnant. Uh, somehow the sort of information containing stuff in the center eventually leaks out and you have some new kind of star-like object. Uh, or possibly another variant is that a black hole never formed to begin with. Uh, that's even harder to... Uh, well, that's another version of this story. Uh, so there have been different, uh, more detailed proposals for this kind of scenario. Uh, there's been the Gravistar proposal of Mazur and Matola. Uh, the fuzzball story of Mathur and many others uh, is of this general form. Well, there are two different variants, whether uh, the fuzzball forms after the black hole forms or whether the black hole never forms. Uh, either of those could be, I think, still an option. Uh, the firewall story uh, that became famous a few years ago is a case of this where you have an object that hovers sort of just outside its horizon and is very violent to infalling observers. And then there's also the Planck star version of this story. And one of the issues with this kind of story is that this sort of propagation of stuff from inside to outside is non-local. It's you know, faster than light propagation. Uh, non-local information transfer, and it would involve some new unknown non-local physics, and you know, we don't really have a precise description of how that would operate. Uh, there are other questions associated with such a so-called massive remnant scenario, uh, beyond what is this new non-local physics. Another question is, if that's what black holes look like, how do we reconcile that with observations now that we have observations? The LIGO detections, LIGO and Virgo, have uh, seen you know, coalescence of things that behave so far just like black holes, as far as we can tell. And if there's some, you know, if we had instead, you know, some kind of new star, you would expect some deviation from uh, the black hole predictions. So that's one question. And a third question is whether a really dramatic departure from the standard black hole picture is truly necessary in order to save quantum mechanics. And so what I'm going to do for most of the rest of the talk is explore the possibility of a more subtle and quantum resolution to the problem, a more subtle uh, story where you don't necessarily have a huge departure from a black hole that suddenly emerges from the horizon, or maybe a black hole never forms, but there, there's a more subtle quantum effect going on. So let's go back to what is needed. Uh, so we have our picture of a black hole. Uh, in, in at least the semi-classical geometry of a black hole, and we need you know, to change this curve from one that's going up to uh, one that ultimately goes back down to zero, zero final missing information. And what's needed to accomplish that is really some kind of information transfer from the internal state, so to speak, of the black hole to at least the near vicinity of the black hole where the information or entanglement can uh, then propagate outwards. That is something that is strictly prohibited in local quantum field theory. If you do local quantum field theory on the classical background of the black hole, that's prohibited by the statement of locality, or, or uh, precisely microcausality, that field operators commute outside the light cone. But somehow that's what needs to happen. Uh, now, there is one important subtlety, in fact, that we are not really talking about just local quantum field theory on a classical black hole, black hole background. You know, the gravitational field should be part of the quantum mechanical system. And there's a subtlety of understanding what really locality is in gravity. In fact, this statement isn't true in gravity, because in gravity, if you have an operator that creates a particle, 
It also needs to create the gravitational field of the particle. Uh, that's the only way to write down, in, in one way of speaking, a, a gauge invariant operator is to include the gravitational field. So a particle is inseparable from its gravitational field, and so if you have two operators creating particles, say here and here, they won't necessarily commute because of the gravitational field uh, that they each have. Uh, and that's been shown in uh, detail in some work from just a few years ago, for example. So there is certainly some information contained in the gravitational field of a particle. And that kind of thinking has led to this so-called soft hair proposal that Hawking made famous, or Hawking plus the press made famous a few years ago, and it's been studied uh, by him and Perry and Strominger, that somehow information is contained in the gravitational field in the so-called hot soft hair, and that could provide a mechanism to avoid losing information to the black hole. Uh, if that's true, that is an order G Newton effect. It's just sort of this leading gravitational field that would be responsible for sort of preserving the information. And by the way, this would correspond to the kind of mistake in reasoning that I was alluding to earlier. We just somehow missed this. Uh, so that's worth more closely examining, and there's been some examination of that. Uh, and in particular, we've looked at that some in a couple of papers here. And this examination suggests, although we're still refining the story, that there really is not sufficient information in the uh, order G. Newton soft hair. Uh, that's still debated, you know, in particular by Andy and so on. And, you know, so it's still under discussion, but that's kind of how it looks to me. Uh, but if that's the case, which I, I think it is, uh, there's still a moral here. And the moral is that localization of information is a very subtle question in gravity. And so we might uh, take off from there and ask the question, can some small delocalization of information actually resolve the crisis? And I'm going to focus on you know, how big that delocalization has to be, and in a sense, it can be much smaller than this, sort of in, instead of perturbatively sized, it could be non-perturbatively small. So that's a teaser for the uh, rest of the talk. Okay, so to explore this question, uh, let's start out with some simple postulates for gravitational physics that you know, hopefully many people would agree are reasonable, although others may want to make more well, different detailed postulates. So the first postulate is gravitational physics obeys the basic principles of quantum mechanics if you formulate them in a suitably general <coughs> fashion. Uh, gravity has, quantum gravity has a linear space of states. There's a unitary S matrix when you have appropriate boundary conditions, so you have ingoing scattering states and outgoing scattering states, uh, and so on. Uh, unitarity holds. Uh, now, of course, that's only one thing we need in a physical theory. Uh, the, uh, you know, say postulating that it's a quantum mechanical theory. Obviously, we need a lot more structure to specify uh, the details of a physical theory. Uh, and a next uh, postulate, uh, which I'll make, which you know again has some subtlety to it because of what we just said about you know modifications to locality and gravity. Uh, but the, the second postulate is that there is a notion of subsystems of dividing uh, you know, a big system like the universe into smaller distinct quantum subsystems. And the uh, example of that I'd like to focus on is a black hole and its environment. And so at least in the usual uh, semi-classical picture, it's clear we can do this. Here's the space-time geometry with those slices and we could, for example, uh, decide that we're going to separate that system into a subsystem outside of this radius and inside of this radius where you know, that's somewhere outside the horizon. Uh, we could put the dividing line at the horizon. Uh, we could even, and I'll actually want to do this for the rest of the talk, well, you could even artificially place the dividing line between the so-called exterior subsystem and the interior subsystem. We could place it inside the horizon. Uh, it's rather arbitrary where we do this. Now, if we're talking about just local quantum field theory evolution, and we look at evolution on those slices, uh, that is governed by a Hamiltonian, which we can also divide up into an exterior piece, H out, an interior piece, H in, 
And then an interaction piece which resides at this dividing uh, juncture uh, and is basically local at that um, boundary uh, and essentially uh, transfers information from you know, one side to the other. Uh, now, if we look at evolution according to this Hamiltonian uh, along these slices, that evolution just in local quantum field theory is unitary uh, if we're basically neglecting the back reaction on the geometry or in effect setting G Newton equal to zero, turning off uh, the gravitational back reaction. But the problem is that once we include, uh, or what, once we allow G Newton to be non-zero, then we have this massive failure of unitarity. That's the original problem. So ultimately this will violate postulate one that uh, we have unitary evolution. Uh, just to restate, uh, oops, wrong direction. Just to restate why unitarity ultimately fails in this local quantum field theory description, uh, once you take into account that G Newton is non-zero, uh, well, this local quantum field theory Hamiltonian only increases the entanglement between the black hole subsystem and the exterior subsystem through you know, producing Hawking, uh, these entangled Hawking uh, particles. Uh, <coughs> So you build up the entanglement that way, and also you could just have some entanglement, say you produce an EPR pair and you throw one partner into the black hole. That also generically will increase the entanglement of the black hole with its surroundings. Uh, and you only get an increase and not a decrease because of this fact that information can't transfer from the interior of the black hole. A corresponding statement is that the black hole subsystem has an unbounded dimension. You can basically stuff arbitrarily large amounts of information into the black hole. Uh, and then when it ultimately disappears, all that information is gone and unitarity is violated. So clearly we need to modify this story if we're going to save quantum mechanics. <clears throat> and so basically if we're going to respect postulate one, we need some kind of, well, that, that is the statement that you know, what goes in must ultimately come back out. So the unitary dynamics must have some interactions that decrease the entanglement of the black hole with its surroundings. That's just required if we're going to have quantum evolution. But now let's introduce a third postulate. We'd like our physical description to be at least close to the standard description of black holes using general relativity plus local quantum field theory. There should be something like a correspondence principle with local quantum field theory, which you could state as follows. Uh, observations of small, freely falling observers in weak curvature regimes are at least approximately well described by a local quantum field theory Lagrangian, and they find minimal departure, to be determined what minimal is, from relativistic local quantum field theory. And that includes observers crossing big horizons. So that includes the statement that uh, you know, those observers don't see anything violent at the horizon, so that this is ruling out the kind of very dramatic departure of a black hole state uh, from the story given by general relativity, like we were talking about in the massive remnant scenario. So, so this is where we postulate that that kind of thing doesn't happen. But this also is where things get a little challenging, and if you're not careful about your assumptions, you do end up with something like a, like a firewall uh, where you're basically annihilated when you cross the horizon. The question is, can you avoid that? I claim you can. Okay, so let's look at the structural modifications needed for this unitarization of black hole evolution. Following these postulates, and then I'll introduce one more. So the first postulate is that uh, the world can be divided into the environment, subsystem and the black hole subsystem, uh, you could uh, parameterize that by saying we have sort of separate labels for the black hole states, labels K, and for the exterior state, we can think of that as a state of basically the quantum fields outside the black hole, and I'm working, say, in the Schrodinger picture, so at a given time, T. Um, so that's how I parameterize this subsystem structure for now. Uh, but again, according to postulate one, uh, this black hole part of the state uh, should behave finite dimensionally. You shouldn't be able to store an arbitrarily large amount of information in there. Uh, there are only a finite number of states. Uh, let's call that number n, which we can also write as the exponential of a black hole entropy. 
And that's the number of states in a range of masses, uh, say, of order 1 over r. That's the first thing we need to change from the standard description. And the second thing is that somehow the interactions must allow information or entanglement to transfer out of the black hole uh, through some new term in the evolution or in the Hamiltonian. So that term must accomplish transfer of information from the state of the black hole to the state of the surroundings to rescue quantum mechanics. And there's a rate, one qubit per light crossing time, which we've already talked about. Okay, so I've assumed uh, that we have subsystems in Hamiltonian evolution. Uh, what about this uh, postulate of correspondence with local quantum field theory? So we've already alluded to the fact that the environment is approximately well described uh, via local quantum field theory, say outside of uh, even uh, a radius that could be fairly deep inside the black hole, but not all the way down near the singularity. You should, you know, local quantum field theory should hold approximately well there. Uh, so H uh, outside and H interaction, you know, the original interaction at this dividing line, uh, both of those should be basically of the form we see in local quantum field theory. I'm going to be agnostic about the structure of the Hamiltonian acting on the internal part of the black hole state. Ultimately, that could be quite complicated. Uh, but then in addition, there needs to be a term in the Hamiltonian that transfers information from inside the black hole to outside. In fact, uh, you know, building on this picture of a black hole as a quantum subsystem, let's think of it as a subsystem, something like an atom, uh, which is just interacting with its environment. It has a very dense spectrum of states. Uh, and what we want is some operator that when you make a transition to go from one black hole state to another, uh, that you uh, also, well, that interacts with the surroundings uh, and you transfer effectively information through that interaction from the uh, collection of black hole states to the state of the surroundings. So the simplest way of transferring information through an interaction is just to have a bilinear interaction of this form. So some operators that act on the environment times, uh, say, a basis of operators that act between black hole states and for now, let's just consider the most general uh, superposition of such uh, bilinear operators. Uh, so we introduce some coefficient functions to parameterize our ignorance, some couplings, uh, and basically sum over you know, all such operators. Uh, so we have a sum over A and B and an integral over uh, the environment of the black hole. So we're just parameterizing our ignorance, but the question is, uh, you know, what form do these couplings take? And we're going to actually constrain those in part through this condition that we don't have a violent departure from standard black hole behavior. And another question will be how large these need to be. Okay, so that's the Hamiltonian I've written down. The first constraint is we want to minimize the departure from local quantum field theory. And so, for example, these um, bilocal couplings should be uh, supported near the black hole. You don't want couplings that transfer information from the black hole to the next galaxy. That's a big violation of local quantum field theory. So let's say they extend out to some scale, let's call it R sub A. But on the other hand, we don't want to confine the couplings too near the black hole. If we say they only extend a Planck length outside the horizon, uh, then basically they act to create very high energy excitations near the horizon. And in fact, this would be a way of parameterizing uh, one of these so-called firewalls. So that would lead to a very violent situation. So sort of the optimal thing is for uh, the radius to which they extend to be comparable to the size of the black hole. That's the natural scale in the problem. And in fact, you know, the firewall story would involve some fine tuning uh, to you know, sort of keep the interactions you know, restricted to the immediate vicinity of the horizon. Uh, the sort of natural thing is that the scale is of order the size of the event horizon, but uh, not, you know, it could, ex the interactions can extend, you know, somewhat outside the event horizon. So the simplest implementation of this story is just to take all scales to be the same, the scale of the black hole, uh, including the characteristic energy scale for transitions between black hole states. And, you know, that's the energy of a Hawking quantum. Okay, so that's a first constraint on these couplings. A second constraint is that uh, 
It turns out there are various Gedanken experiments we can think of, and one of which is uh, called mining a black hole, where you take a black hole and you introduce a cosmic string that threads it, and that will increase the rate at which a black hole evaporates, because there are the modes along the string which can basically get out. And you want, uh, if you have an increased rate of decay of the black hole, uh, increased rate of you know, it losing energy or mass, you also want an increased rate of information transfer. So these couplings, uh, this suggests, uh, should couple to any possible fields uh, in the vicinity of the black hole, say fields we could excite uh, when we introduce a cosmic string. There's also an argument based on a correspondence with the beautiful story of black hole thermodynamics. Um, so both of these suggest uh, what you may think is an optional postulate, in fact it may, may turn out to be necessary, uh, that uh, the departures or these new couplings, the departures from uh, the usual local quantum field theory description influence matter and gauge fields in a universal fashion. And the simplest way of doing that is if these couplings don't couple to any old operator here with arbitrary strengths, but uh, coupled to just the stress tensor. Uh, and so, in fact, you know, that's kind of natural in gravity. Uh, gravity likes to uh, be universal and to couple to the stress tensor. Uh, and so we'll uh, postulate this, you know, fourth postulate that the couplings are of that form. Uh, if that's the case, then this combination of these coefficient functions, parameterizing our ignorance, and the basic operators that describe transitions between black hole states, uh, those together can be thought of as uh, an operator which behaves like a perturbation in the metric, so a black hole state dependent metric perturbation. And for example, you could ask what's the typical size of that in a typical black hole state, and we'll come back to that question, you know, what's the typical size of a metric perturbation that is responsible for transfer of information from the black hole internal state to the black hole environment. Uh, before we address that size, well, what sets that size? Well, we need sufficient information transfer. We have to save quantum mechanics, and so we need information to transfer from inside the black hole, or from the black hole internal states to the exterior. Now, one thing that would clearly suffice is if this metric perturbation were of order one in size. It's of, if it's of order one and it's fluctuating on scales of order you know, r, that's again, the only scale in the problem for now, uh, then uh, clearly that could transfer information at the rate of roughly one qubit per light crossing time. But that also would mean that there's an order one metric perturbation uh, in the vicinity of the horizon of the black hole. And you might try to look for that. That could possibly produce observable effects when you look at black holes, like is being done with the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope is basically a network of telescopes giving a baseline the size of the Earth uh, that has already taken data, and we expect to hear from them in the next upcoming months. Uh, and given that baseline, they are able to, uh, they think, or well, they, they know, we don't know what they've found yet, but uh, uh, the, the claim was that they would be able to resolve uh, the image of light coming from very near the horizon of a black hole, specifically the one at the center of the galaxy and the one I mentioned previously in M87. And so there's a prediction for what that image would look like, but if there are these order one metric fluctuations, uh, that uh, prediction is changed. And we, I did a little simulation, uh, well, uh, together with one of the principles on the Event Horizon Telescope, Demetrius Saltis, actually he did the numerical work to show what fluctuations like this might do to the image they see, and it would be a very characteristic time-dependent signal that could be quite interesting. So that would be absolutely fascinating to see some departure from the predictions of standard GR uh, in images that are found at the Event Horizon Telescope. But before we get too excited, uh, let's come back to this question. What's really a necessary condition for adequate information transfer from a black hole? And this, in fact, touches on a general problem and a conjecture in quantum information theory. Let's suppose we have two subsystems of a quantum system, one much bigger than the other. Uh, and those could be a black hole in its environment 
or a quantum sensor and its environment, or a quantum computer and its environment, or a thermal subsystem of a bigger system. Uh, this is a fairly generic kind of problem. Let's suppose that uh, these are governed by a Hamiltonian consisting of a term that acts on one subsystem plus a term that acts on the other plus an interaction term. And we want to know how fast the interaction term transfers entanglement or information between the two subsystems. So let's parameterize things a little bit more carefully. Let's suppose that the uh, states of A have a characteristic energy scale E. We factor that out of the interaction Hamiltonian so everything else is, is dimensionless. We normalize the operators in some fashion. Uh, so, uh, and in particular, we assume the interactions have this bilinear form we've been talking about. And then the question is, given these coupling constants, uh, how fast does such an interaction transfer information? Uh, what do we mean by transfer of information? Well, again, like in the black hole context, we're really interested in entanglement. So we can take subsystem A and make an auxiliary copy of it, uh, at least mathematically speaking, consider the maximally entangled state between the two, and ask how fast the mutual information between A bar and A transfers into mutual information between A bar and B. That's a way of quantifying it. Uh, in order to uh, answer the question, one more assumption, you want to assume that basically evolution of A scrambles things fast enough, so you might take, say, a random matrix Hamiltonian or something like that. Uh, and given uh, this structure, there's a conjecture that, uh, in fact, was made in this paper about how fast information transfers. Uh, here's a basic formula for it. Uh, you know, the characteristic energy scale plays a central role, and then the coupling constant squared. Uh, this is something we're uh, working on checking in a more general story, but already have found evidence for in uh, certain toy models. Uh, and again, that has that story has applications you know, beyond this whole black hole business. Uh, but let's turn just to the black hole case and let me try to explain uh, what this is saying in that context. So here's the form of our interactions. And uh, one way of thinking about it is the following. So we have some interaction term that couples the black hole state to the surroundings. And we want to know how fast that transfers information. Well, a rough measure of that is just how fast does this interaction cause a transition where the black hole emits a quantum. Uh, roughly speaking, we might think for every quantum that comes out, a bit of information could come out. So let's use just Fermi's golden rule to answer the latter question, how fast do we have transitions? And uh, so that's given by the density of final states times the matrix element squared of the interaction term between the initial and final states or the typical size of that. And we want this transfer rate to be of order one per light crossing time. That's what we said. Uh, now, an important point, however, is that this rate includes the density of black hole final states. And the number of black hole final states is huge. Uh, and so that means that these matrix elements can actually be tiny. If we have a density of final states that's exponentially big, uh, these matrix elements can actually be exponentially small, or the square root of exponentially small. Uh, and that corresponds to the statement that these uh, coupling constants or coupling functions that we use to parameterize our ignorance could also be exponentially small. In fact, this comes back to the question of you know, how small this is when you put G Newton back in, basically an effect of order e to the minus 1 over G Newton. Uh, and that really is in contrast to some previous lore and beliefs on the subject uh, that somehow you needed uh, a big alteration of the geometry in the vicinity of the black hole. Uh, now, it's true you need a significant correction to the state, uh, to the quantum state of the surroundings of the black hole. Uh, so it's, you don't have a small correction to the state uh, in line with the arguments I described earlier based on, well, Page's original analysis and then, of course, uh, Mathur's re-explanation of that. Uh, so you want an order one change to the state, but you can produce such an order one change from a small interaction due to the enhancement from the large number of black hole states. And so, for example, if you uh, put differently, compute the typical size of 
uh, this state dependent metric fluctuation, the typical size of that also is order one over the square root of n or exponentially small in the uh, black hole entropy. Uh, okay, so that I think is rather interesting that you can get what you need from basically very tiny couplings because of the large number of black hole states. Uh, how at a more basic level might we understand such effects? That's the first question. Well, the, as I said, the story of locality of information is a one in gravity. Uh, and it may be, you know, when we really understand quantum gravity, uh, some modification to the sort of semi-classical story. Uh, we likely need a more intrinsically quantum view of information localization and transfer, and in fact, of space-time itself, ultimately. Uh, and we should be trying to figure out what that looks like. I, I've made some initial comments on that in a couple of papers that I cite here. And also you might ask whether this is somehow realized in the story of ADS-CFT and you know, there have been sort of related discussions, for example, this morning in Kyriakos Papadimus' uh, talk about you know, how you really think about uh, in ADS-CFT, uh, say states inside a black hole and, and so on. You know, if you have this picture of emergent space-time. Uh, so, so that's, though, the idea that there, you know, when we think about it semi-classically, we aren't correctly describing how information is localized. There are small corrections to that. A second question is whether there are any observational constraints uh, now on this story where the fluctuations are quite small. So you don't have these large, uh, approximately classical fluctuations. Uh, but let's ask the following question. If we have, say, a photon scattering off of a black hole in the presence of these interactions, uh, what do the interactions do? And they can cause transitions. And in fact, by a Fermi's golden rule argument, now with initial state, you know, with my incoming photon and outgoing photon in the final state, uh, you know, I can likewise estimate the, the probability for a transition I, I still have this large number of black hole final states, so I can still get basically an order one result for scattering. But because these couplings are, so to speak, soft, because they have a typical scale of order r, the black hole size, the typical momentum transfer here is of order one over the radius of the black hole. It's associated with this nonviolence condition. And so that really is going to be a tiny effect on matter and light. Let's take, for example, a photon seen by the Event Horizon Telescope. It has a typical wavelength of a millimeter. Uh, so a typical momentum of order one over a millimeter. Well, the size of the black hole uh, in Sagittarius A star is something like 10 to the 7 kilometers. So this is an incredibly tiny uh, relative momentum transfer. It would have an incredibly tiny effect. However, there is one place where we are looking at radiation uh, that has wavelength comparable to the size of the uh, black holes in question. Uh, and that's when we look at gravitational wave signatures uh, from, say, LIGO and Virgo. And so it may be that ultimately a more careful version of the story could uh, yield a change in the absorption, absorption cross-section, for example, for uh, colliding black holes. And that may lead to a visible signature. That's uh, for future exploration. Uh, but a very interesting thing to look at. Okay, so to sum up uh, what we've said so far, this set of postulates, quantum mechanics, uh, that we can divide the world into subsystems, correspondence with the local quantum field theory, and universality have led us to the idea of a sort of quantum gravitational atmosphere for black holes that are responsible for basically relaying the information to the outside world. I've given two versions of that story. One, the coherent version, uh, which would be possibly visible in electromagnetic channels, namely at the Event Horizon Telescope through modifications of the optical image. Uh, and then there's this incoherent version uh, via tiny couplings, which would be hard to see in the electromagnetic spectrum, but possibly in the gravitational wave spectrum. You know, more generally, just a comment, you know, even if you think this story doesn't make sense to you, I hope you don't think that, but if you do, uh, you know, consider our present situation independent of my postulates. There's common agreement that reconciling black holes with quantum mechanics requires modifying quantum field theory at scales of order of the event horizon size, and we have just acquired 
two new observational windows on these scales through very long baseline interferometry, event horizon telescope kinds of measurements, and gravitational wave observation. So this really is something to think about. We've entered a new observational realm, and I've made some general comments on that story by going beyond, for example, in this reference. But that's something we ought to think about. Okay, well, I'm just about out of time, so let me just summarize the uh, talk. Uh, so first, this unitarity crisis appears to point to a, an error of principles, not some simple stupid mistake, but you know, there's really something wrong with our currently formulated principles under, that provide the bedrock of current physics. Uh, and so this crisis seems to be providing a guide to the new quantum physics of gravity, the more fundamental physics of quantum gravity. Uh, and uh, that's really interesting. And plausibly, it's related to the need for a more quantum notion of localization of information, more quantum notion of space-time. It may be that classical space-time is just not a correct fundamental concept. Uh, and so I've, again, made some comments in a couple of references that you could look at if you want to you know, see a little bit more about what I have to say about that. Uh, a second point to emphasize is, again, this is not just a short distance problem of fluctuations at the Planck length. This is a problem where new physics is needed on horizon scales of uh, you know, arbitrarily big black holes, and there are some really big ones out there, and in principle we can consider you know, arbitrarily big ones. Uh, in trying to figure out what that physics could be, I've introduced a simple, what I think are plausible set of postulates for uh, quantum gravity uh, that quantum mechanics holds, unitary evolution holds, uh, in that you can divide quantum systems into subsystems, at least in an approximation. Uh, these first two postulates are basically the statement that, okay, information can get into a black hole, but it had better get out at the end. Uh, and then a couple of more postulates, which I think, uh, again, seem plausible to me, uh, the correspondence postulate and the postulate of universality, and together they, those are something like a quantum equivalence principle or a weak quantum equivalence principle. Uh, and well, it could play that, that role in the, uh, in the basic structure of the theory. Uh, and those four postulates together lead to this picture of uh, quantum gravitational atmospheres or soft quantum structure of black holes. Uh, and we also find that very weak interactions, as I said, can transfer information out of a black hole, uh, contrary to various prior thinking. And uh, this also, uh, you know, involves discussing a more uh, general problem involving transfer of information between quantum subsystems. In fact, that was a problem when I first encountered this question. I said, well, you know, the quantum information theory people should, you know, know what the general statement is about that. I just have to go ask them. And I went and started asking various quantum information folks that I know, and no one knew the answer. So, uh, you know, in fact, it appears that there are some general bounds and so on, but uh, this, this general question has not been answered given a you know, a set, certain set of couplings with certain properties, how fast does information transfer? And that's you know, a very general question. Forget black holes, it's just an interesting general question. Okay, so we've made contact with that. And finally, uh, there's at least the prospect of observational probes of, or at least constraints on, this very foundational problem uh, through the electromagnetic spectrum as observed by the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, and that, as I stated, could see effects if the quantum atmosphere of black hole was in a sense coherent. Uh, and also, of course, through the beautiful gravitational wave observations being made by LIGO and Virgo, which potentially are sensitive to the kind of incoherent effects that I uh, described. So I'll stop there a little early and leave time for questions. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, I don't get a microphone. Uh, if you speak, yeah, loud, it's okay. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, there, there are many things that probably requires uh, verbal discussion. Because I disagree fundamentally with a lot of things. Uh, I thought you'd agree fundamentally with at least some of them. Well, fundamentally, all of us agree that there's a information should come out. I don't think any, anyone. Not everyone agrees, but okay. a lot of us okay. do. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, we'll agree. Let's so let's agree to agree. That, but, like, no, no, this, but of course, we agree on that, and we agree that there must be corrections. Uh, and by the way, these corrections are clear, because then, for, I said yesterday, for a finite mass <coughs> rules, temperature is not constant. And the moment temperature is not constant, the, the state, there is no way to be exactly thermal. Yeah, but that's not sufficient to save you from the unitarity that's problem. Not, that's not sufficient, because it tells you that already there are corrections. Yeah. And the corrections are not exponentially small. They are one over the entropy. Yeah, but again, that doesn't so solve the entanglement is, problem. No, that, that is the amount which is, I claim, that is the amount that is sufficient to solve this other problem. It doesn't tell you how to solve the problem. Well, For that, you need a microscopic theory. Yeah, those corrections would have to take a particular form if they were to solve the entanglement problem. Just changing the temperature doesn't do it. I can radiate one photon at one temperature, another photon at another. Yeah, okay, good. What I'm saying is okay. that that gives you a window of the strength of the corrections. Now, of course, then we need a microscopic theory to answer yeah. these questions. Now, the, the thing is that I gave, gave you an example of a microscopic theory. Hmm. A model we, of one, yeah. Yeah, a model, a toy model, mm -hmm. right, in which you can trace everything. And it, it works qualitatively, all these mysterious features of, of black holes. You can see that it works in that way. And it, okay. no, that's, also, that's obvious. Because yeah, it has some of the features we, so well, anyway, I see this is. You can, is you can, okay. you can do it, and mm -hmm. you can see that the, the things that uh, this discussion about how information comes out, how entanglement develops, thermal, everything we can trace there. Yeah. I mean, there are, by the way, with that model, two right. questions, you know, that I, we kind of ended with at the end. That's so. the model of okay. Let's discuss this talk and with the... All right. Okay. model, I can see, that of course, information comes out, of course, entanglement develops, but not the way you said. So then, given that already a toy model violates what you said, why should I be limiting for quantum gravity? So it well, comes out, but in a different way. Not, in the way, not, not one bit per, per emission. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. what, 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 the way it, we'll discuss this tomorrow in great detail. Yeah. Uh, so the well, there was this question of when information did come out. And if it doesn't come out early enough, then you're back in the paradox. No, you have something that... Gradual, in that model, there is no paradox because it's a unitary toy model. Yeah, in unless you're left with a re unless you have a toy model of a remnant. <laughs> That ends up with a remnant, and then you're stuck. No, so, this no, 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 model is being traced, but what I'm saying is that there we see yeah. that information comes out gradually uh, in both ways. There is a gradual come out of information, and then there is also, uh, after a certain critical time, macroscopic, that you were asking yesterday, there is some more intense coming out of information. We'll discuss it tomorrow. But okay. what I'm saying is that, so, that, that sort of, there is this picture that we, we were developing for a few years that I fully agree, there is no quantum, there is no classical. Universe, I mean, nature is quantum. So, of course, there is no classical metric. What we think is classical metric obviously should be some kind of quantum state. Or well, some approximation. Right. Some, absolutely. Classical is an approximation. So, so we, we have this idea that black, black hole is a bite of gravity. Simply, it's a, it's a multi graviton state. Yeah. And, 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 and so, you may, did, of course, you may not believe it or something. It seems that you are completely dismissing this possibility. You, you are, so, so, somehow, you have probably very strong argument. Against that. And uh, I would love to discuss this. What is the argument? Yeah, I, there, I think there are some tests of that potentially, but you know, this was not the time to try to fit in every possible discussion. No, because that, so. if that's true, then there's a <coughs> microscopic way to try to understand why information and, and why we don't need breakdown of, of quantum mechanics, why we don't need to sacrifice locality, CPT, yeah. and this kind of stuff. That would be a, a framework to, yeah. to think about. Yeah, you know, that's did worth you thinking have about. Argument against that, that would be great. No, I did not attack your approach in this no. <laughs> colloquium. So. But, uh, you know, I think there are some questions about no, that I, kind of picture, I, like how you get something that looks like a semi classical black hole from a condensate of gravitons. And, you know, there are various other questions. But again, this is not really anyway, a time okay, where we should discuss. I, I prefer to ask questions <laughs> about uh, Steve Scott. Okay. Uh, we can right. postpone the discussion for after the talk. Uh, Sven. So, regarding the line of observations, so will there be, is there a clear signal already that kind of predicted 
Uh, yeah, it's really the uh, plunge and merger, probably more towards merger. And uh, there isn't yet a, um, a clear prediction, but I think you know, there's some indication. For example, if you enhance the absorption rate of gravitational waves uh, into the black hole, uh, you know, that's going to affect the outgoing signal, uh, conversely. Uh, that you see at LIGO. Um, now there's one issue with that, and that is, you know, roughly speaking, by the time the black holes get close together, they're already deep in a gravitational well. So if you change their absorption cross-section, uh, that may uh, not have a huge impact on the, out on the outgoing gravitational signal because the, you know, the would-be outgoing gravitational waves from that region uh, ultimately end up in the final black hole anyway. So, so there's a question of uh, you know, how big the effect would be and it basically takes uh, more analysis. Uh, and, you know, so again, that's something I'm leaving for the future and am you know, actively interested in pursuing. I, I maybe also like to ask a question and you will get back. Um, Please? Many people show this curve so you, where the entropy first increases and then uh, should decrease in order to save utility. And how can yeah. you predict that it increases all the time? Right. right. Um, is it also still a kind of logical possibility, at least, that the curve from the very beginning does not increase, uh, but the entropy stays constant all over the evolution, including not only the Hawking radiation, but also the collapse of the of the infrared matter. Maybe this has even to do with uh, Gia's question when we talk about. Uh, yeah, I don't know your questions. <laughs> but uh, yeah. okay, then yeah, very very um, very crudely, is there a logical possibility that the curve um, is not uh, monotonic first and then decreasing, but it's constant? Yeah. So, um, so Hawking's original calculation, or at least you know calculations that refine that, you know, show this increase in curve. So you'd have to ask, you know, what's wrong with that story? And I've tried to classify possibilities. You know, one is that we made a simple mistake, but you know, when you look at it more and more carefully, and a lot of people have done that, there's no obvious simple mistake that would lead to a change from the upward going curve to something that's flat. The other possibility is that there's a new effect, uh, and if it really were to stay flat, uh, that would mean you're just not building up more entanglement. Yeah. And so that would be an even more drastic effect, more dramatic effect, I think, in some sense, that you know, begins operating immediately uh, and immediately sort of drastically changes the structure of Hawking radiation. Uh, and so you know, at this stage, since we don't have a fundamental theory of quantum gravity, we can't you know, rule that out. But in some sense, that's more dramatic, and it, it appears to be sort of less conservative uh, and you know, is the spirit that physics is often conservative in its solution to problems. Uh, basically, yeah. it would mean that there is no entanglement at the horizon, and the Hawking could yeah. come out. Uh, basically. Yeah, there's something really wrong with the picture where you are sort of producing these pairs. Yeah, that's true because you, you, you mentioned me. <laughs> Not to make an impression that I disagree with everything Steve said. I fully agree with that, with that graph. Okay, fine. And actually, by the way, this toy model actually reproduces that graph. So I think that. And it comes down at the half-life? Exactly. Oh, okay, because that, when I asked you yesterday, you said you didn't know when it came down, but anyway. No, no, yeah. I, I said after macroscopic time. No, sorry, if I, so it oh. starts coming down after macroscopic time, the, 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 the entanglement. Okay, yeah, okay. So, uh, other more questions? Um, so, I just wonder, uh, non-local correlation is a feature of quantum physics. Yes. So Um, well, so quantum physics do, does have, you know, things that look and feel non-local, and that's been one of the things that really bothers some people about quantum physics. But there's a sharp notion of locality in quantum field theory, and that sharp notion is that you can't send a signal outside the light cone. And that actually is encoded in this basic statement of microcausality that I wrote down, that the basic field observables commute outside the light cone. That tells you that if you, you know, source, or if you act on this, say, the vacuum state with the source, 
that you never get a signal outside the light cone. So, so in that sense, there is, you know, in quantum field theory, a precise notion of locality. And that's, however, what must be apparently violated in the, you know, if you try to describe the black hole from the semi-classical geometrical perspective. Um, they're actually just in, in quantum field theory. There's a notion of subsystems. This gets a little technical and so go, goes beyond a um, colloquium level uh, discussion. But there's a notion of subsystems based on the notion of a split vacuum. And it, this is just in quantum field theory. So you know, put aside all the gravitational story. Uh, and basically if you take a, a region in a small buffer region around it, which is essentially providing a cutoff, uh, then you can write down a state where you have complete, completely disentangled uh, excitations inside the region and excitations outside the extended region. They're completely disentangled, completely decorrelated. And so that's a nice sharp way of defining what you mean by uh, subsystems in the context of uh, just quantum field theory. Uh, and, you know, of course you have some, you know, sort of excitation in that state, in that buffer region, but uh, you still have a sharp notion of this, you know, separation into excitations inside and excitations outside. Other questions? One more question, maybe the last Please. question. Okay. Um, there was last week a paper by Hawking, Stranger, and uh, others, right? who were uh, refining their analysis about the software. And I think uh, um, basically they computed uh, some algebra of, the, of charges. And uh, if I understand the paper correctly, they again reconfirm their claim that the software carries the full amount of entropy of the black hole. Can, can yeah. you comment on this new work? Uh, I have not dug into the new paper. Uh, but the question is trying to reconcile that with uh, you know, some other work which you know, extends this discussion of what is a subsystem in quantum field theory into the discussion of what is a subsystem in quantum gravity. Uh, and so you know, there, there is a question of somehow reconciling you know, what they're saying with this, but essentially what we've shown in trying to think about subsystems in quantum gravity is that at least in an approximation, uh, you can have uh, a state of matter, uh, say in a region, or different states of matter, uh, such that the only, uh, well, such that the gravitational field outside the region only depends on the Poincaré charges, the total Poincaré charges of the uh, matter excitations. And so in that sense, there are always, there appear to be configurations of the gravitational field where in some sense you can set the soft charges equal to zero and so you can have independent information in a region that's not seen in the gravitational field outside. Uh, and if so, that exhibits sort of a, a decoupling between you know, the information and in, you know, some matter excitations and the information in the soft charges. But you know, it's suggestive that they get the right kind of counting and you know, there are some subtleties to this whole discussion. So that's why I indicated that this is still something that is uh, you know, worthy of further investigation and, and I think uh, you know, we need to converge on that. I think it's now time to stop, so I'd like oh, to ask oh, oh. one more no, a short question, okay. a short question. Do you have any thoughts on whether classical physics fits for The classical what? The, the classical decomposition principle. Oh, cluster decomposition. Uh, no, I think that there's you know, some indication that cluster decomposition fails in gravity because you can go to very large distances, but if you're looking at high energy enough excitations, uh, you still basically have gravitational influence. But that's a more involved discussion. Okay, so I believe that there are no more questions anymore, so we can do it again. Thank you.